Good morning, Keystone Church. So glad that you're joining us again for Church Online here this weekend. If this is your first time joining us, I wanna welcome you. My name is Lauren Foster, I'm the pastor here at Keystone. I would also love to personally invite you to join us in person for one of our services. Sunday mornings, 10 a.m., same time as the service that you're watching right now. We're located at the RLA, the Regional Learning Alliance in Cranberry. Would very much love to meet you, your family, welcome you to our church, and meet you face to face. And if you've been with us for any length of time online, over the past couple months, we've been in a study where we're walking through the book of James. This is week eight, and we're actually gonna be wrapping up James chapter four here this morning. But before we jump into the scripture, I wanna to skip to the very end and let you know that this passage is extremely direct and yet very subtle. Because James is talking to believers about who is really in control of their lives. Where is their confidence? And you would think that if someone is claiming to follow Jesus, that the obvious answer would be Jesus. But as James is about to highlight, sometimes that's not always the case. So the question I would love for you to consider here this morning as we jump in to the Word of God is asking and self-reflecting, do an evaluation for where you're at, who is really in control of your life. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go out to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Pray with me here today. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have to open up your word, learn from your scripture. God, and we do want to confidently know where and who we trust when it comes to control and it comes to our life as a whole. Lord, we want it to be you. Help us see your truth here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, right before my family and I, we moved to Pennsylvania in the summer of 2019, June 1st, 2019 to be exact. And prior to making that move, when we knew we were gonna be on the path in this process of planning Keystone, I remember talking to some very trusted pastors and people that I've admired and that have invested in my wife and I and in our lives for many years. I said, what do I need to do? How do I need to get prepared? And coincidentally, Marcus Brown, who you heard from a couple weeks ago, he said, you've got to get organized with your calendar, Foster, like never before. I said, great, Marcus, help me. What do I need to do? And he actually provided me a resource, a daily planner that could track out all of my activities. And not simply for a day, but it was for every day, every month, every quarter, and eventually every year. And so the idea was that you get so well planned and efficient with how you're organizing your daily routine that you become more productive, hit more goals, and feel more accomplished at the end of the year. So I had a high level of confidence as I was exiting 2019, heading into 2020, because I'd been using this planner, getting some traction, feeling like I was starting to understand the flow and the design and the intention behind it. And then we launched Keystone January 19th of 2020. Eight weeks later, the plan and everything that I had written out basically went out the window. In fact, that planner, all that organizational skill that I had prepped for prior to the start of the year, it was basically worthless because my playbook went out the window and everything quickly changed as it did for all of us. I learned a valuable lesson in 2020, and perhaps you learned a similar lesson, that I am not in control. 
Maybe there are times and maybe there are certain areas of my life where I feel like I have a measure of control, but the reality is my plans can certainly change without notice. And if there are five words that I could just encourage you to consider, maybe even repeat wherever you're at watching this message here today, it would simply be this phrase, I am not in control. What is James even trying to say in this passage of Scripture? Does it even relate to us here today? Well, let's first remember what James is attempting to accomplish with his writing. James is the brother of Jesus, but did not follow Jesus while he was alive. He ended up becoming a Christ follower, a disciple of Jesus after Christ died, rose again, appeared to him. Later on, we see a record of that in the New Testament and James and his life was totally transformed. And the book of James is one of many general epistles. In fact, an epistle is a letter and there are seven general epistles in the New Testament. There's James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John and Jude. And the general epistles, these general letters, were not written to a specific church, but to the big C church in an effort to encourage the Christian church at large. And when James wrote his letter, the believers, they were on the run. I mean, they were facing persecution, they were being martyred, there was so much opposition coming against the local church. Followers of Christ were on high alert. They're plagued with opposition outside of the church, and yet they're dealing with conflict and opposition from inside the church as well. Here they are, fighting for their lives, and yet we see through James and his writings that believers are fighting each other as well. Non-stop family drama, think sitcom slash Jerry Springer television in the 90s. It's always dramatic. You can't imagine what's taking place. And James is extremely practical in what he's writing. He's very direct, crystal clear, not pulling any punches, and he's communicating to the believers as they're reading this letter, and the name of the game with James is consistency. He's saying, I want your life to match your beliefs. I want who you say you follow to line up with your daily routine. That phrase that we see here in James 4, now listen you who say, the interesting part about that paraphrase in the Greek is that it's a little aggressive. It would almost be the image of a coach grabbing a player by the face mask and bringing him in close and just kind of yelling at him like, come on, you got to get this, what I'm about to say. Even in the most literal sense, that kind of phrase would have been used as a parent correcting a child that wasn't representing the family values. And so what James is trying to get a point, the point that James is trying to get across when he says that is that, hey, what I'm about to describe to you is not consistent with how a Christian should be living. And maybe you think back to when you were a kid in your behavior, you maybe you, you did something that your mom or your dad or a family member, they would immediately call you out and correct you. And uh, in my home, with my mom, whenever I heard her say the words, Mr. Lauren, whenever I heard Mr. Lauren, I knew I had done something wrong. Because when I was addressed in that way, it was this mother right now, my mom, she means business. In my home, the phrase oftentimes that my wife and I use are, is, are you kidding me? Like if our kids do something that is ridiculous or we can't believe they actually made that choice or that kind of a poor decision. It's, are you kidding me? I mean, think about when maybe this doesn't happen in your home, but it happens in ours. You go into the restroom and you see right before anything else, there is a roll of empty toilet paper just sitting there. No one has changed it out. And the last person that left was one of your kids and that would again, elicit a response. Are you kidding me from my wife and I? 
It just doesn't line up with the family values. And when he says, now listen, you who say, who's he referring to? Well, he's referring to the believers that the letter addresses, but then it becomes very clear in verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Scholars would say that the portion that's being written here in Scripture right now was addressing the wealthier merchant class, these self-confident, deliberate planners, like they had a goal in mind. They knew where they were headed. They had an aim to make money. They were very confident that they were going to be able to succeed and that their plans would be a success as well. And the picture that James paints here would be familiar to these uh, first century readers because there was all this growing commercial activity uh, in and around Palestine and Jews were especially active in these type of business ventures to basically go out, pursue financial gain, conquer, advance yourself in your world. I mean, this passage relates directly to us as Americans today, to the planners, to the go-getters, to the A-type personalities. And even if that's not how you're wired, or even if that's not your demeanor, you're an American, which means by default, we're presented and encouraged to pursue this kind of path on a daily basis. The American dream. You want it, go get it. Work hard, save your money, pursue your dream. If you can believe it, you can have it, you can achieve it. Even with what we want to purchase on a daily basis, Amazon, I'm, I'm able to get whatever I want, two days or less, delivered to my front door. And it's this dynamic and paradigm that starts working its way into our life that we're conditioned to pursue what we want, protect what we have, and you and I, we become the common denominator. And you may even think, as we start to read this in James, is James trying to say not to make any long-term plans or to not be consistent or faithful when it comes to preparing for the future? Not at all. James isn't trying to say, hey, don't purchase life insurance or investing doesn't matter or you shouldn't save money for a rainy day. And he's also not criticizing people that make money or that earn. He's, he's not criticizing someone that would invest their finances to better off their future down the road. James is not condemning capitalism or good, prudent planning. He's confronting the tendency that all of us have which is to become more reliant on ourselves than we are on God. To place our confidence in something that is temporal, that in the end can sabotage what is eternal. And interesting enough, earlier in the book, James references pride, and then he starts this dialogue at the end of chapter four, and we see a bridge being connected. That pride leads to presumption, and arrogance, and James comes straight forward in verse 14. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Proverbs 27.1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. You know, a few weeks back at our church, in the middle of worship, we prayed for a family locally, a family that lost their father. Um, and it was a kind of an abrupt, tragic situation. And we were praying for the family and it dawned on me that a couple months back, I'd had breakfast with this gentleman and we had been talking about some different things regarding outreach and ministry and um, our church locally partnering with some initiatives that would help advance the gospel. And we were just kind of dreaming out loud for some plans in 2022. And then I got word that he had, had fallen ill and it got worse, he didn't recover, and then he eventually passed away and he's in heaven. I just remember thinking through and, and meeting some of his family at the funeral and I'm, I'm sharing my condolences and I just, I thought, man, this is just, it's unbelievable. A couple months back we're having breakfast and now this and how brief and how short life is. And I kept thinking, Lord, life truly is short but you are good and I am not in control. 
the idea that I'm going to have what I want, when I want it, that my hopes and dreams are going to be fulfilled. And what's worse is when we have this kind of mentality that everything that we plan is going to come to pass, it could end up becoming even toxic to our faith because we indirectly may even think it's God's responsibility to make our dreams a reality. And it's not simply the mentality that I want my way, it's the arrogance that I believe that my way is actually best. But in reality, my plans, like we said at the beginning, are always subject to change. Life is but a mist, as James says. It's, revi it's revisiting the question that we asked at the very beginning, who is in control of your life? You know, my wife reminded me of this when we were, uh, when our kids were younger. We had seen and, and, and watched parents that would, would harness their toddlers, where uh, they'd have a, a kid that would kind of get unruly and run off. And, and we've all probably witnessed an example of this, or maybe, you know, I remember even as a parent, I experienced this in our own life, where our kid gets excited when they were younger and they run off in the middle of the mall or at a department store and you, you chase them and you can't believe that they ran away from you as soon as you sat them down. Well, they have harnesses now where you can actually, almost like a, an animal on a leash, your kid runs away, you can reel them back in. And it seems a little bit a little bit ridiculous. And if you're a parent that's utilized one of these harnesses, zero judgment. But sometimes I think that that's the picture, that's the mentality that we have when it comes to the Lord. We think we're harnessed, that God just wants to hold us back. You just want to control me, God. When the truth is, the Lord isn't looking to control your life. He's looking for you to surrender to His plan. Because a submitted life is one that recognizes my life is not my own. I'm not the one in control. I need someone else in the driver's seat. And it's exhausting trying to navigate everything in my life on my own. Jesus actually referenced this kind of heart in Luke chapter 12, verse 15 through 21. It says, then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll store up my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it'll be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. And once again, this is not condemning someone who is wealthy or who falls into the highest tax bracket. It's a parable Christ is teaching that echoes the heart of James. The way of Jesus is surrendering what we want and submitting to what he has. It's shifting our mentality from I'm self-made to now I'm self-aware. My confidence isn't found in my plans, my possessions, or my personal agenda. It's found in Christ alone because my life is a mist. Here today, gone tomorrow. It may kind of sound discouraging when you first hear it, but it's actually uh, a scripture that goes on uh, in James that offers so much hope. In verse 15, instead you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Matthew 6, 10 even says the same thing, echoes this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. James is encouraging us to have a new qualifier for our life, a new mantra. Instead of saying in your heart, I'm in control, I'll make it happen, I call the shots, it's now saying, Lord, I'm completely dependent on you. It's not my way, it's Lord, if it's your will, if it's a part of your plan for my life. 
It's not a passive approach to life. It's a personal dependence on Jesus. Verse 16, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. James is saying very strongly, to boast and presume you know the future is foolish. To live in that way, it's the pride of life. And we want to control things and, and we want to call all the shots in our life because if we are being honest with ourselves in a very strange way, we almost, we want to be God. We want to be in His seat. We want to be the one driving the car. And we got to remember that when James is writing this letter, he's rebuking Christians. He's calling out the drift that can happen in our lives. It's so slow. It's subtle. It's like when you're driving down the highway and you can feel that your car is out of alignment. And you didn't notice it at first, but now it's pulling to the left every time you're driving down the road. And you have to try to fight that drift, that momentum that is pulling you from one side and you're trying to turn the wheel back to stay straight. If you've ever invested money with a financial institution or with uh, someone that works with retirement plans, they always have to make a disclaimer to you. The past performance doesn't guarantee future returns, which is a very kind way of saying they could lose your money. <laughs> you may not make as much as you hope. But the reality is, even the best financial planners, those that are extremely savvy with retirement accounts, they will tell you if they're honest that they cannot predict and guarantee with certainty what will happen next. So here's our hopeful declaration this morning. God, I don't want my plan I want your purpose. I don't want my way. I want your will. We may not know what is coming next, but we do know who we can trust. That person is Jesus. And it's the reason why the gospel is full of these now terms and that kind of language. Today is the day of salvation. Why? because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Life is but a mist. So why not grab a hold and trust Jesus today? Because I truly believe he's created you, purposed you, called you, saved you, redeemed you, breathed life into you, has a purpose and a plan for your life. And that kind of God a loving Father has so much more for your life than you could ever plan on your own. So let's keep our trust fully established in Christ, in Christ alone. Keystone, I want to thank you for being with us here this weekend. As always, we have a prayer team here. We would love to know as a church how we can better serve you. If there's any questions we can help answer, please message us, comment wherever you're watching this message. Our team would love to follow up, reach out, help make our church feel a little bit more like home for you. Can't wait to see you next weekend. We're actually gonna be speaking on something very, very vital to the heart of our church. Can't wait to see you then. God bless.